Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stone. I think I'm still your new senior pastor, and I'm glad to be here. I'm definitely still glad to be here. Uh, we are uh, we're in the second week of a series called Putting Down Roots. I want to say before I get started, I just want to say a quick word of thanks. You have been just the warmest church over the last week. Uh, we have received so many notes. We had a group serenade us at our home. Your staff has done a, just a tremendous job welcoming us. We already feel like we're a part of the family. If we were excited last week, we're, I don't know what's more, not, what's the right word for more excited. We're more excited this week than we were last week to serve alongside you and can't wait to get to know you. So thank you for welcoming me and Margaret and Charlotte and Jackson so well. You've done a great job at that. So we're going to continue the series, Putting Down Roots. Uh, last week, uh, we were in week one. So here's the, here's the idea for where we're headed uh, over these first three weeks. It's really kind of a get to know you series that's based on a passage from Isaiah chapter 37. Right? Remember that God's people are in crisis. There's an army at the gates of Jerusalem. The people are scared about the future. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, sends a word of comfort and a word of hope that sounds like this. It says, a remnant of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. There are brighter days ahead. Right? You will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. This was God's word of comfort and hope and purpose for his people who were in trouble. And I just love the image of root and fruit as an image to help us kind of get to know each other, right? What are the, what are my roots? What are our roots as a church? What are, uh, what are the fruit that God is calling me to bear? What's the fruit that God is calling us to bear as a church? So we're just using that image of both root and fruit to get to know each other over these first three weeks. Last week, we started in Acts chapter 8 with the story of the B-team uh, disciple named Philip preaching in a place that nobody really wanted to go. It was a place called Samaria, uh, Samaria Sebasta. And we talked about how a lot of us have had that notion, have had that experience of feeling like Samaria. I'm not sure if God wants me. I'm not sure if I'm worthy. And yet God is sending word of his gospel to us from the day that we're born. God is chasing us from the day that we're born so that we might know the power of belonging to him, the power of what it means to be one of God's own. And so that's where we were last week. We talked about roots uh, and, and how we are rooted in our identity as children of God, and it's that identity that drives us forward. So that's where we were last week. This week, we're going to continue the story because the truth is the, the story that we hear about Philip in the first half of Acts chapter 8 isn't the last time that we hear Philip. It's not even the most famous time, the most famous story that we hear about Philip. So we're going to pick that story up this week in Acts chapter 8, same chapter, but we're going to do the back half of chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to take them out. You can look at your Bibles. If you've got your Bible on your phone, you can do that. Nobody's going to judge you. It's going to be okay. Look at your Bible on your phone uh, and turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 26. And here's how this part of the story begins. It says that an angel says to Philip, Right, same guy that we were talking about last week. An angel says to Philip, I want you to go down to the road that is a wilderness road, a desert road. I want you to go south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And before we continue on, I need to make a confession. And here's the confession. The truth is that my nerdery knows no bounds. It, it's good for you to go ahead and know that. It's better for me to confess it on the front end. That way you don't have to awkwardly discover it in like six minutes from now. I'm just a huge nerd. One of the facets of my nerdery is maps. See, I told you. I told you I'm a nerd. I love maps. But here's why I love maps. I love, in particular, I love biblical maps, and here's why. The reason is that for a lot of us, when we read these stories in Scripture, they tend to hover above the earth. But they're almost a different realm. Not only are they a different time, but they're almost a different realm. They don't even happen on our world. They're so, uh, they're so uh, wrapped in uh, either baggage or mystique or whatever it is that they tend to hover above the earth. A map helps us land these stories in real dirt. They help us remember that the stories of Scripture, beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, these are stories that unfold in our world. 
It, they unfold on the dirt that you and I travel. So I'm going to use a lot of maps. I would apologize, but you know, it's just who I am. So it's better for us to go ahead and start to know each other on that front. So I want to go ahead and put up a map this morning. I want you to see a, a Google Earth image. This isn't a drawing. This is a satellite image. This is the actual dirt that Jesus walked. That you can see the Mediterranean Sea on the left. You can see the Dead Sea in the south. You can see the very southern tip of the Sea of Galilee on the north. The Jordan River runs between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea in the bottom. So that's the land that we are going to be getting that we're going to be getting familiar with. We want to begin to build a mental model, as a friend of mine likes to say. We want to build a mental model, not not because we want to win at Bible trivia. Is anybody still going to Bible trivia? Is that still a thing? I don't know. The reason we're doing maps is not about Bible trivia. The reason that we're doing maps is we want to land this story in real dirt. The truth is, understanding the map isn't going to change our interpretation or our understanding necessarily of the story we're looking at today. That won't always be the case, but today it's the case. The sole reason is so that we can recall and celebrate that God has been working on this piece of dirt for thousands of years, since the beginning, God has been at work in our world. So we're going to take a look at it. I want to go ahead and put up where, Ju- where Jerusalem was. That's where Philip started his journey last week. He traveled to Samaria, Sebasta, which is north of Jerusalem. You can see that up there. And this week, uh, uh, Philip is being called by an angel to travel to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there's a couple things that are important about this. One, it's interesting that the angel doesn't tell Philip to go to a city. He says, go to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then there's this note that, oh, by the way, it's a desert road. And it's a desert road, not because that road is traveling through the desert between Jerusalem and Gaza. That's not the desert. But after you leave Gaza traveling south, that road that Philip is supposed to be on becomes a wilderness road. That's the uh, Gaza it was the last stop before you entered the wilderness between Israel and Egypt. So it was kind of a portal city. That's where you would stop to gather supplies before you make this last most difficult phase of the journey. So that's where the story unfolds. That's where the angel tells Philip to go. But sometimes it is as important what is not said in Scripture as what is said in Scripture. And this is one of those cases. Because take note what Philip does not say in response. Right? When the angel tells Philip, I want you to go south to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza, here's what Philip does not say. He does not say, um, well, yeah, but I don't get it. Why, why would I go there? Philip doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I don't understand why you want me to go there. Why would I do that? He also does not say, yeah, but there's nothing there. You're not even sending me to a city. There's nothing important there. Why would I go there? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, okay, but did you see my work in Samaria? It was pretty good. The Holy Spirit, you came, God. You can't, you showed it, you changed people's lives. Simon the sorcerer, he gave his life to you. Did you see what I did in Samaria? Shouldn't I get like a promotion for that? Why are you sending me here? And he does not say, well, yeah, but I'm pretty busy, God. You gave me these whole Samaritans. They're a real problem. Okay, they just will not settle down. They keep going back to worshiping other gods. They're just a real troubled group of people. I think I'm going to stay here. He doesn't say any of that. You know what he says in response? You can read it. It's the first sentence in verse 27. You know what he says? Nothing. Read the first sentence of verse 27. So he got up and went. When the angel tells Philip, go south to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, Philip's only response was to start out on the journey. He heard God's call. He heard the word of the angel, the messenger from God, and he responded. He listened and he obeyed. Friends, that's, that is discipleship. That, that is what it means to follow Jesus. What Philip didn't do was say, but I don't know where that's going to take me. What am I going to find when I get there? He doesn't do any of that. He simply hears 
and responds. And take note too, by the way, that this was not a spiritual response from Philip. Right? He doesn't hear God's call and say, oh, yes, what a great call. Thank you, God, for sending me this, sending me this call, and then go on about his business in Samaria. It wasn't a spiritual response from, from Philip. It was a physical, he moved himself in response to what God was telling him to do. This is what it means for us to bear fruit. I'm just going to cut to the chase. That's the bearing fruit that God wants of us. As we take root downward into our identity as children of God, the fruit that God is calling us to bear isn't necessarily an outcome. It's the journey of faithfulness. It is hearing God's call and changing our lives because of it, making different decisions today because of what God is calling us to do. This is the fruit that God requires of us. Now, in the middle of verse 27, we take a bit of a turn. Luke, as he describes the story, starts out in kind of a different direction. He starts talking about on that road, there was an Ethiopian eunuch uh, who was a member of the court of the Candace in Ethiopia. Candace was a name. For us, it feels like a name. It's more title there. Uh, Think of uh, Pharaoh or Caesar. That's what Candace is. So what we're hearing from Luke, what Luke, the author of Acts, is telling us is this is an Ethiopian man who's a a eunuch who is an official uh, in charge of the treasury in Ethiopia. And there's a few things that we need to just just take note of before we dive a little bit deeper into that story. The first one is he's Ethiopian. And I just want to take what I'm about to tell you, take it and put it in your pocket and save it for later. Here's, here's the thing about Ethiopia. In the, world, in the Roman worldview, Ethiopia is the southernmost tip. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing more southern than Ethiopian in the Roman worldview. Now, you and I know that's not true, but in the Roman worldview, which shaped Israel in this point in history, that was as south as it gets. Just take that, put it in your pocket, and leave it there for a minute. The second thing is, this man is a eunuch, which means we can go back and read throughout the Old Testament. We can go back and read, because he is a eunuch, He has been discounted from the kingdom of God. He cannot even enter into the temple because of who he is. Because of who he is, he has been excluded. That makes it all the stranger, by the way, that Luke tells us he's coming from Jerusalem, headed back home to Ethiopia. And what was he doing in Jerusalem? He was worshiping. But he couldn't have even made it into the temple because of who he is. And yet this man, wanted to worship God. There was something compelling about the God of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, that this guy wanted to know more about. Even though he was on the outside, he wanted to know more about that God. He wanted to worship that God. So now as Philip makes his way towards the road that this Ethiopian eunuch is traveling down, as their paths begin to converge, God shows up again, only this time it's not an angel, it is the Holy Spirit who tells Philip, look, I want you to go to that chariot, because this Ethiopian guy, he's riding in a chariot, he's very important, he's very wealthy, he's very powerful, important, wealthy, and powerful people travel by chariot in this world. Okay, Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. What does Philip not say? He does not say, yeah, but God... um, That's a lovely invitation, but this guy doesn't count. This guy doesn't matter. Why why would I go talk to him? He, He doesn't get included in the kingdom of God. That is exactly what Philip does not say. And I'll tell you what he what he does say. Listen to this. This is in Acts chapter 8, verse 30. So Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the Ethiopian. Reading the prophet Isaiah, we didn't expect that. This Ethiopian man shouldn't be in the story. He shouldn't have been in Jerusalem. He shouldn't be in this story, and yet he was in Jerusalem. He was worshiping God. Now he's in the chariot, and now he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. He's reading Isaiah. And then the Spirit said to Philip, go over to the chariot. Um, And Philip ran up. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? That's what Philip said to the Ethiopian. Do you understand what you're reading. And the Ethiopian man replied, how can I unless someone guides me? 
And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. I love this part of the story for a couple of reasons. The first reason I love this part of the story is Philip begins with a question. Right? Philip doesn't begin with a, hey, I know more than you. I'm going to tell you about it. He doesn't begin with, I belong and you don't, so let me just you know, make sure you know I'm better than you. He doesn't begin with a condescending tone that says, you're less than and I'm greater than. He begins with a question that simply says, hey, do you understand? Do you know what you're reading? And it was that simple question that created an opening. And it was the exact opening for which God sent Philip to a road in the middle of nowhere with no idea why. How can I? How can I understand if no one guides me? I love this model of discipleship. Philip hears the call. Philip responds to the call again and again, by the way. And then he guides someone. He offers to guide this man. And by the way, what does that mean about how Philip sees the Ethiopian? He sees this man for one belo- as one belonging to God. He doesn't see that he's an Ethiopian. He doesn't see that he's a eunuch. He doesn't see that he is powerful and wealthy. He sees that this man needs to hear about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can I unless someone guides me? Here's how it unfolds from there. They sit down together, and the passage of Scripture that he was reading was out of Isaiah chapter 53. Here's what he was saying. This is what this man was reading, not knowing what he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb, silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. You and I know this passage in Isaiah is about Jesus. But the Ethiopian's question was, who is he talking about? Who is this, this prophet from 600 years ago? Who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? And then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news of Jesus. He told him the story. Starting with where the Ethiopian was. Right there in Isaiah, which, by the way, two chapters later, or three chapters later in Isaiah 56, there's a beautiful passage about God's invitation to even the foreigner. Even the Gentile is, is invited into the kingdom of God. Even the eunuch is invited into the kingdom of God. I bet that's where Philip started. And it is not at all where he ended. Because he goes on to tell the story of the one who gave his life. That we might find forgiveness, healing, healing and life eternal. That's where he went with the story. And as they're riding along, as Philip is telling, there's something about the way that Philip is describing Jesus. There's something about the the work of the Holy Spirit through Philip in that moment. This Ethiopian sees a body of water right there, and he says, what's to prevent me from getting baptized? And Philip's response is, I don't know, nothing. Let's do it. It doesn't say that in the Greek, but I feel confident that that's how that went down. Let's do it. And so they get out of the chariot. Philip baptizes this Ethiopian. And I love that as the Ethiopian man comes up out of the water, it says that the Holy Spirit snatched Philip away and sends him to a place called Azotus, which is on the Mediterranean Sea. And Philip continues preaching the gospel all the way north on the Mediterranean Sea, all the way back towards Samaria. He was sent there for a purpose but he had no idea why. Not in the beginning. He did not have a clue. When he was sitting in Samaria, basking in the victory of God's ministry in Samaria, and the angel shows up and says, I want you to go south to the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. You think Philip had any idea what would happen? No, I don't guess he did. All that he did, we make Christianity so complicated. All that Philip did Listen to the word of God and respond. That's it. 
I think I'm drawn to the story not only for its simplicity, but because it's, it's what I've tried to do with my life. Right? It makes me think about when I was halfway through my college experience, right? Halfway, I'm having a good time rolling along, and suddenly the realization dawns, oh, college is going to end at some point. I guess I better figure out what that means for me. I guess I better figure out where am I going to go? And I was fortunate to have been formed by pastors who said, you know, when you're asking questions about what you want to do with the rest of your life, you should consider asking God, what is it that God wants me to do? Not, not what do I want to do, but what is it that God wants me to do? And so that started for me a process of discernment about, I don't know, 15 or 18 months of constant conversation with friends and pastors and uh, people around me as a constant season of prayer. And I fasted during that season trying to figure out, God, what do you want from me? And I had this growing sense that I had some gifts and graces that might make me effective, but I was also clear that just because I thought I might be good at it did not mean God was calling me to do it. And so I was racked by this uncertainty, a lack of confidence in what God wanted me to do. Uh, it was accompanied by large amounts of sweat and anxiety as well. What am I going to do as time goes by through my college career? What is it that God is wanting me to do with the rest of my life? And I went down to San Antonio one weekend. They have great tacos. I went down to San Antonio and I woke up on Saturday. And as soon as I woke up, as soon as I woke up, I've never been able to adequately describe it. I knew with a confidence that I knew had not come from me that my next step was to go to seminary. I didn't know what would happen beyond that, but I knew with a confidence and with a peace that I had never experienced before, this is where God was calling me. Go to seminary. Why? What was going to happen after that? I didn't have a clue, but I knew that God was calling me to go to seminary, and so that's what I did. And while I was there, I met my wife, Margaret, and as we, uh, as we made our way through the end of sem seminary, which I did fortunately survive, as we made our way to the end, we again asked that question, God, where do you want us to go? And for some reason, God was calling us to Kansas. We had no idea why we were going to Kansas. That wasn't in the plan. That wasn't what we set out to do. We made fun of Oklahoma last week. Perhaps Kansas needs some making fun of, too. We didn't know what we were going to Kansas for. What's there? Why would we go? We didn't know, but we knew that God was calling us to go, and so we went. And the same thing was true with, with Kingwood near Houston, Texas. The same thing was true in Northeast Texas when God sent us to Tyler. The same thing was true in 2019 when we realized God is calling us to Georgia. Why is God calling us to Georgia? Texas has such great barbecue. Why is God calling us to Georgia? We didn't know, but what we were clear on was that God was calling us. And what Philip convicted me of at an early age was that if God's calling, then ours is not to know exactly what will happen when we get there. Ours is simply to go. The fruit that God invites of us isn't the outcome. The fruit that God invites, perhaps expects of us, is simply to make the journey. That's all Philip did. He just made the journey. And along the way, along the way, he runs into this Ethiopian man who has been searching for who knows how long for a word of good news. Ours is to make the journey of faithfulness wherever it is that God is calling us to go. It makes me think about our, our high school folks. Our high schoolers who were uh, in Seattle this week, when they left, when they flew out yesterday morning, they didn't know what they were going to find in Seattle. It's the West Coast. They didn't know what they were going to find when they got there, and they didn't need to. What they knew was God had called them, and so they went. And yet again, the church is led by that next generation. They just went when God called them to go. Ethiopia was the southern, here's the kicker, Ethiopia was the southernmost tip of the known world. Remember back in Acts chapter 1, one of the last things Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. We've already seen that. You're going to be my witnesses in Samaria. We saw that last week. And then what's the last part? 
You're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Do you think when, you think when Philip was in Samaria and God said, go south, you think, you think Philip knew that by responding to that simple word, he would be fulfilling the great commission and sending the gospel to the ends of the earth? I bet he didn't know. And yet God did it. Brothers and sisters, family of God, God is calling. I don't mean just us. We'll talk more about us next week. I mean you. God is calling you. So the question is, are you listening? If you're not listening, that's okay. But it's time to start. If you are listening and you haven't responded, my question to you would be, why? Are you not sure what you're going to find when you get there? If that's what's holding you back, I have good news for you. It's going to be okay. If God's the one calling, what are you going to do? Say no? And friends, if God is calling, and if you have responded, I can't wait to hear. I can't wait to hear what you find when you get there. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks this morning for Philip's story yet again. Oh God, we are grateful for the the call that you put on his life, for his willingness to simply say yes. God, we confess that there have been times that we have not heard your call because we weren't even listening. We confess that, oh God, and we pray that you would heal our ears that we might once again, or perhaps even for the first time, hear the word that you're sending our way. And God, for those of us who have heard your call and not responded, God, we confess our lack of trust to you. We confess our fear. We confess our need for control. And we pray, O Lord, for healing. O God, we want to be Philip. Oh God, we know that you're calling us to be Philip, to hear and to respond, to guide your people into your kingdom. Use us, oh God. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.